Section 6 of Reviews by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Rose. Reviews by Oscar Wilde. Edited by Robert Ross. Section 6 Hamlet at the Lyceum. Dramatic Review, May 9. 1885. It sometimes happens that at a premiere in London the least enjoyable part of the performance is the play. I have seen many audiences more interesting than the actors, and have often heard better dialogue in the foyer than I have on the stage. At the Lyceum, however, this is rarely the case, and when the play is a play of Shakespeare's, and among its exponents are Mr. Irving and Miss Ellen Terry, we turn from the gods in the gallery and from the goddesses in the stalls to enjoy the charm of the production and to take delight in the art. The lines are behind the footlights and not in front of them when we have a noble tragedy nobly acted. And I have rarely witnessed such enthusiasm as that which greeted on last Saturday night the two artists I have mentioned. I would like, in fact, to use the word ovation, but a pedantic professor has recently informed us, with the Batavian buoyancy of misapplied learning, that this expression is not to be employed except when a sheep has been sacrificed. At the Lyceum last week, I need hardly say nothing so dreadful occurred. The only inartistic incident of the evening was the hurling of a bouquet from a box at Mr. Irving while he was engaged in portraying the agony of Hamlet's death and the pathos of his parting with Horatio. The dramatic college might take up the education of spectators as well as that of players and teach people that there is a proper moment for the throwing of flowers as well as a proper method. As regards Mr. Irving's own performance, it has already been so elaborately criticized and described from his business with the supposed pictures in the closet scene down to his use of peacock for paddock that little remains to be said nor indeed does a lyceum audience require the interposition of the dramatic critic in order to understand or to appreciate the hamlet of this great actor i call him a great actor because he brings to the interpretation of a work of art the two qualities which we in this century so much desire the qualities of personality and of perfection a few years ago it seemed to many and perhaps rightly that the personality overshadowed the art no such criticism would be fair now the somewhat harsh angularity of movement and faulty pronunciation have been replaced by exquisite grace of gesture and clear precision of word where such precision is necessary for delightful as good elocution is few things are so depressing as to hear a passionate passage recited instead of being acted the quality of a fine performance is its life more than its learning and every word in a play has a musical as well as an intellectual value and must be made expressive of a certain emotion so it does not seem to me that in all parts of a play perfect pronunciation is necessarily dramatic when the words are wild and whirling the expression of them must be wild and whirling also mr irving i think manages his voice with singular art it was impossible to discern a false note or wrong intonation in his dialogue or his soliloquies, and his strong dramatic power, his realistic power as an actor, is as effective as ever. A great critic at the beginning of this century said that Hamlet is the most difficult part to personate on the stage, that it is like the attempt to embody a shadow. I cannot say that I agree with this idea. Hamlet seems to me essentially a good acting part, and in Mr. Irving's performance of it there is that combination of poetic grace with absolute reality which is so eternally delightful. 
indeed, if the words easy and difficult have any meaning at all in matters of art, I would be inclined to say that Ophelia is the more difficult part. She has, I mean, less material by which to produce her effects. She is the occasion of the tragedy, but she is neither its heroine nor its chief victim. She is swept away by circumstances and gives the opportunity for a situation of which she is not herself the climax and which she does not herself command. And of all the parts which Miss Terry has acted in her brilliant career, there is none in which her infinite powers of pathos and her imaginative and creative faculty are more shown than in her Ophelia. Miss Terry is one of those rare artists who needs for her dramatic effect no elaborate dialogue, and for whom the simplest words are sufficient. I love you not, says Hamlet, and all that Ophelia answers is, I was the more deceived. These are not very grand words to read, but as Miss Terry gave them in acting, they seem to be the highest possible expression of Ophelia's character. Beautiful, too, was the quick remorse she conveyed by her face and gesture the moment she had lied to Hamlet and told him her father was at home. This I thought a masterpiece of good acting, and her mad scene was wonderful beyond all description. The secrets of Melpomene are known to Miss Terry as well as the secrets of Thalia. As regards the rest of the company, there is always a high standard at the Lyceum, but some particular mention should be made of Mr. Alexander's brilliant performance of Laertes. Mr. Alexander has a most effective presence, a charming voice, and a capacity for wearing lovely costumes with ease and elegance. Indeed, in the latter respect, his only rival was Mr. Norman Forbes, who played either Guildenstern or Rosencrantz very gracefully. I believe one of our budding Hazlitts is preparing a volume to be entitled Great Guildensterns and Remarkable Rosencrantzes, but I have never been able myself to discern any difference between these two characters. They are, I think, the only characters Shakespeare has not cared to individualize. Whichever of the two, however, Mr. Forbes acted, he acted it well. Only one point in Mr. Alexander's performance seemed to me open to question, and that was his kneeling during the whole of Polonius's speech. For this I see no necessity at all, and it makes the scene look less natural than it should. Gives it, I mean, too formal an air. However, the performance was most spirited and gave great pleasure to everyone. Mr. Alexander is an artist from whom much will be expected, and I have no doubt he will give us much that is fine and noble. He seems to have all the qualifications for a good actor. There is just one other character I should like to notice. The first player seemed to me to act far too well. He should act very badly. The first player, besides his position in the dramatic evolution of the tragedy, is Shakespeare's caricature of the ranting actor of his day, just as the passage he recites is Shakespeare's own parody on the dull plays of some of his rivals. The whole point of Hamlet's advice to the players seems to me to be lost unless the player himself has been guilty of the fault which Hamlet reprehends, unless he has sawn the air with his hand, mouthed his lines, torn his passion to tatters, and out-heroded Herod. The very sensibility which Hamlet notices in the actor, such as his real tears and the like, is not the quality of a good artist. The part should be played after the manner of a provincial tragedian. It is meant to be a satire, and to play it well is to play it badly. The scenery and costumes were excellent, with the exception of the king's dress, which was coarse in color and tawdry in effect. And the player queen should have come in boy's attire to Elsinore. However, last Saturday night was not a night for criticism. 
The theater was filled with those who desired to welcome Mr. Irving back to his own theater, and we were all delighted at his reappearance among us. I hope that some time will elapse before he and Miss Terry cross again that disappointing Atlantic Ocean. End of section 6, Hamlet at the Lyceum.